This is the Dr. Beter audio letter, box 16428, Fort Worth, Texas, 76133. Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter speaking. Today is June 21, 1975, and this is my monthly audio letter number one. A lot of things have been happening lately that probably have you concerned and puzzled. Things like the Mayagas affair, the prospect of financial collapse of New York City with domino effects throughout the economy, and so on. And all of these things are important. But what I hope to do in my monthly reports to you is to try to focus your attention squarely on the most basic developments. Understanding these most basic matters will, I believe, enable you increasingly to grasp the significance of details in the news yourself. And once the American public can see through the daily diet of clever, subtle propaganda which is served up by the major media as news when it really is not news at all, then the jig will be up for those who are trying to take our country and our freedom away from us. In this audio letter, I therefore want to discuss just three topics. One, an important matter concerning evidence in the Fort Knox Gold scandal. Two, recent indications from President Ford that the plans for economic depression and dictatorship in America are still on track, and an introduction to our next President and would-be dictator, Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller. First about Fort Knox. You know the Fort Knox Gold scandal is just like the Watergate scandal in one respect. There is a desperate cover-up going on right now just as happened with Watergate. The Fort Knox Gold Scandal cover-up really passed the point of no return last September when the United States Treasury perpetrated the Fort Knox Gold Inspection hoax in an attempt to discredit my charges that there's no gold in Fort Knox because it had all been illegally removed. Since that time, the government has been getting in deeper and deeper and deeper, involving more and more people in all sorts of maneuvers to try to keep the lid on. For example, when the congressmen and newsmen visited Fort Knox last September, news stories promised everybody that the visit would be followed up by an audit of the Fort Knox gold by the General Accounting Office. But what they actually did was just a very superficial exercise just to make the record look good, and the group of 15 men that did it had only two General Accounting Office representatives on it. All the rest were from the Treasury itself. In other words, the fox went into the hen house to count our chickens for us. And then there was the fraudulent gold auction on January 6th of this year in which the Treasury sold some gold obtained illegally a month earlier from the Small Exchange Stabilization Fund. Only a fraction of the fund's gold was sold in January. Now they're about to follow that up with a second fraudulent gold sale on June 30, 1975, using part of what is still left over, barring unforeseen developments to prevent the sale and so on. But to me, one of the most disturbing things we have unearthed lately came as a complete surprise to me, since it involves none other than Senator Barry Goldwater, of all people. Senator Goldwater has in his possession some very sensitive and important papers which explain in detail how the nation's gold could be easily removed from Fort Knox and spirited away which I charge has been done. These papers consist of the manuscript of an unpublished book about Fort Knox, which was being written by the late Mr. Stanley Tatum, T-A-T-O-M. Tatum was a mechanical engineer and was stationed at Fort Knox as an Army major in the 1942-1943 time period. 
Major Tatum was in charge of some secret but major modifications of the Fort Knox Gold Depository at that time, modifications whose purpose was to make gold retrieval easier. On April 28, 1943, President Franklin D. Roosevelt visited Fort Knox to view the progress of this work. After the war, Tatum returned to civilian life as a mechanical engineer and businessman. Now, Tatum probably knew more than any other man on earth about the Fort Knox Gold Retrieval System, and years later he decided to write a book about it. But he never got to finish polishing it up for publication because in October 1973 he died on an operating table under some very strange, mysterious circumstances. One story is that he bled to death for lack of availability of blood of his type, even though the operation was not an emergency one. And it was only the following month, November 1973, that the final huge shipment of gold out of Fort Knox began, taking until early March 1974 before the shipment was completed. Now Tatum had become friendly with Senator Goldwater some years prior to his death, and Goldwater knew all about the book and obtained the manuscript to read it. In particular, Senator Goldwater has the crucial Chapter 12, which gives the details on the retrieval system, but he seems to be sitting on it and I just can't understand what he is waiting for. So far he won't even answer the letters and telegrams that have been sent to him on this subject. Why? Where is Chapter 12 on Fort Knox, Senator Goldwater? Mind you now, I'm not accusing Senator Goldwater of being a part of this gold thievery in any way, not at all. The Fort Knox gold theft is a project of the four Rockefeller brothers and their accomplices from start to finish. But my question is, why isn't Goldwater doing anything with this vital information he has in his possession? Doesn't he know how significant it is? Doesn't he still care what happens to America? Has he become afraid of the Rockefellers? like so many other Senators and Congressmen? Or has he decided to join the false opposition, working secretly with the Rockefellers behind the scenes? Does he think he sees the handwriting on the wall for America as written by the Rockefeller dynasty? I would like to have the answers to these questions from Senator Goldwater himself. I turn now to the second topic, recent developments involving President Gerald Ford. Early this month President Ford strangely fell three times in one day on a state visit to Europe. The next day he was seen stepping cautiously down an aircraft ramp, holding on to both handrails, while Mrs. Ford walked down ahead of him with the greatest of ease. The news media quickly explained it all away with a big fury of items about his football knees as the source of the problem. What you may not know, however, is that a week or so later, after public interest had been deflected to other matters, a quiet and little-noticed announcement was carried in Washington papers in which President Ford's doctor stated flatly that the falls had nothing to do with his knees after all. No other medical explanation was offered, but I'm informed that President Ford's health does seem to be deteriorating for reasons which are not yet made clear. On June 16, 1975, President Ford did something completely unprecedented in American politics. He endorsed his presumed running mate, Nelson Rockefeller, for 1976, even though he himself still has not announced his own candidacy. A year ago I was told by one of my informants, the late Mrs. Louise Boyer, who was Nelson Rockefeller's private secretary 
and confidant for over 30 years, that Ford would leave office well before the end of his term to be replaced by Nelson Rockefeller. She furthermore expected that this would occur by June 1975, this month. It may well be that Ford's oddly premature endorsement of Rockefeller and the appearance of health problems on Ford's part are signs that the planned elevation of Rockefeller to the Presidency is in fact near at hand. In any case, the next day, June 17, 1975, the third anniversary of the Watergate break-in, President Ford made a rousing speech to small businessmen meeting at a national convention here in Washington. He said a lot of things that were exactly what the audience wanted to hear. For example, he said he was certain we are now at the bottom of the recession and that an upturn lies just ahead. That remark and a few others like it were picked up by the press and are probably all you heard by way of the major media. But woven deftly through his speech were a sequence of key phrases which paint a very different picture, a picture which coincides exactly with the chilling plan for an American dictatorship about which I have been trying to warn for two years. Briefly, this plan is for the United States to be manipulated into terrible economic straits by Election Day 1976 so as to complete the collapse of confidence in our free way of life that has been fostered increasingly through educational and other means for decades. On Election Day 1976, we are to vote, among other things, in a referendum, not a customary procedure at all here in America, to scrap our present Constitution and accept a new one in its stead. The new Constitution, which is to be the subject of an audio book I plan to tape soon, has already been written and would totally reorganize our government along totalitarian lines and abolish free enterprise in favor of total governmental control and regulation. With this plan in mind, listen now to a sampling of phrases from President Ford's speech that were not part of the crowd-pleasing rhetoric which the press reported to the nation, quote, In the months ahead, we face a very critical choice, preservation of free enterprise or a headlong plunge into governmental regulation, unquote. The words critical choice harken back to Nelson Rockefeller's Commission on Critical Choices for Americans on which Gerald Ford served after becoming President. In turn, Rockefeller got the Commission's name from a book published in 1930 with Rockefeller Financing, The American Rich by Hoffman Nickerson, an associate of Nelson Rockefeller's. The book argued that we would one day have to make a, quote, critical choice for Americans, unquote namely, replacement of our Republic with an hereditary dictatorship. This is, in effect, what President Ford said we face within a matter of months now, regardless of the pablum about an upturn fed to you through the major media. Next, quote, from my travels, Americans have not arrived at a consensus for collectivism." Unquote. Also, quote, we have not held a referendum unquote, to repudiate our present system. President Ford merely said we have not done these things, but his implication was that we have not yet done these things things which should be unthinkable. Why in the world would he mention a referendum? 
Just take a glance at Great Britain, which is further down the road we are now traveling. For the first time, the referendum has made its appearance just this month there, and it has been identified as a symptom of failure of representative democracy and a harbinger of basic political change. The consensus for collectivism mentioned by President Ford is exactly what the deliberate economic disaster lying just ahead is supposed to bring about. In the ensuing panic, it is by referendum that the planned scrapping of our Constitution is to be accomplished. In another passage, President Ford said, We are now seeking, quote, a new balance between the public and private sectors." Unquote. But what new balance? A mixed economy en route to total collectivism? He didn't say. In a final example, Ford objected in his speech to, quote, "...those who criticize free enterprise and propose nothing in its stead." Unquote. But Nelson Rockefeller is all ready to propose something instead of free enterprise in the new Constitution, his Constitution. Thus everything continues to point to the fact that the Rockefeller dynasty, controlled by Nelson and his three brothers, is still moving forward steadily with a game plan to terminate our free republic and install Nelson Rockefeller as our first dictator. It therefore behooves us to stop and consider carefully the nature and background of our next President, Nelson Rockefeller, on August 20, 1974. When President Ford introduced Nelson Rockefeller as his choice for Vice President, he failed to give Rockefeller full credit for his extensive experience in the Rock Roosevelt and succeeding administrations. The same was true of Senator Hugh Scott later during the confirmation hearings when, for public consumption, he condescendingly told Rockefeller that now he was getting a taste of how things operate in Washington. Imagine. On his return from a year-long honeymoon trip around the world, 25-year-old Nelson Rockefeller was put in charge of the completion and renting of Rockefeller Center, and also helping the, to direct the Roosevelt administration by his father, John D. Rockefeller, Jr. He immediately organized with two former college classmates a company to collect monies on everything that went into the Rockefeller Center construction, contracts, material, labor, and so forth. This proved so profitable that he ousted his partners and merged it into the so-called philanthropy Rockefeller Brothers Fund, where it still remains and which was reported to me recently. Nelson Rockefeller earned the enduring support of George Meany by providing employment to his plumbers, as well as other construction workers at Rockefeller Center, at the princely price of $15 for a 48-hour work week. However, when the workers decided that they needed more pay to live on, Rockefeller gave one Joe Adonis the job of convincing the workers that they didn't really need that extra money after all. Adonis did his job, but instead of paying him off, Nelson Rockefeller then had him deported. The Rockefellers played a key role in the nomination and election of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Nelson Rockefeller was then installed as Roosevelt's closest advisor, as related, for example, in a New York Times article on May 22, 1960. In Rockefeller language, closest advisor means boss, and the New Deal, which is generally attributed to uh, FDR, was actually designed to start carrying out the transformation from republic to totalitarian government prescribed in the Rockefeller Finance book, The American Rich, 
which, as I have mentioned, was published in 1930. Nelson Rockefeller induced Roosevelt to proclaim the so-called bank holiday closing all the banks. All banks controlled by the Rockefellers were permitted to reopen, refinanced at taxpayer expense. Many other banks, however, were permanently closed. This maneuver greatly enhanced the Rockefeller dynasty's control over our banking and credit system, which was already strong by way of their Federal Reserve System, which helped create the crash of 1929. Using Roosevelt as his mouthpiece, Nelson Rockefeller next ordered all United States citizens to turn over all our gold to the private central banking system of the Rockefellers the Federal Reserve System in violation of the Constitution. The fact that authorities all agreed that this could in no way alleviate the prevailing depression was beside the point. A handsome profit was made by shipping the gold abroad while the price was $20 an ounce and bringing it back to the United States soon afterward uh, to collect $35 an ounce for it. The present Fort Knox Gold scandal is a replay of the same game plan, but this time for vastly higher stakes. Nelson Rockefeller also stepped into active planning for World War II. The war was to be used both to take over the Saudi Arabian oil interests of Great Britain and also to crush Japan, which was trying to open up vast Chinese oil fields that the Rockefeller interests had suppressed for years for monopolistic purposes. In his very first Cabinet meeting in 1933, Roosevelt reportedly startled everyone by declaring that he wanted to be a wartime president and wondered if a war with Japan could somehow be arranged. But he had to be patient. It took eight years for the Rockefeller Finance Institute of Pacific Relations to give him his wish. The matter of Saudi Arabia was a holdover from World War I, which, which the Rockefellers had used to their own ends. The Rockefeller support behind the scenes made Germany such a threat to Britain that the British concluded the Allies could not win World War I without American help. As the price for an American intervention, the Rockefellers extracted a deal from the British, turning over the Saudi Arabian oil concessions to them to exploit. In return, the Rockefellers withdrew support from the Kaiser and quickly arranged through Woodrow Wilson, the first president to be a complete puppet of the Rockefellers, to have American soldiers sent to fight the war to end all wars. The Saudi Arabian oil concessions thus cost the Rockefeller Standard Oil interest nothing, but they cost America a quarter of a million lives and a huge national debt. But not satisfied with merely the Saudi Arabian oil concessions, the Rockefellers also proceeded after the First World War to wrestle control of the German chemical, dye, drug, and dope companies away from the British, merging them in 1926 into the worldwide cartel known as the IG Farben Industry AG. This so infuriated Churchill and the British that they used boycott tactics to block the Rockefellers from actually developing the Saudi Arabian oil, refusing to grant visas to Standard Oil employees turning down clearances to ships trying to carry needed supplies and the like. The Rockefellers concluded that a Second World War would be just the right medicine to cure Great Britain's embargo on Saudi Arabia. The German war machine, which they had supported in World War I, had produced a cooperative British attitude before, and it would presumably do so again. A man by the name of Adolf Hitler, who at the time was a minor factor in Germany, was selected for this purpose and was brought to power through the support of the Rockefeller-controlled IG Farben Industries and other German-controlled industries of the Rockefeller family. 
Nelson Rockefeller observed Hitler closely during his worldwide honeymoon trip mentioned earlier and participated in Hitler's rise to power and the strengthening of Nazi Germany, whose rise to power has always been a puzzling phenomenon to most observers. 1929, the Rockefeller Standard Oil of New Jersey, now known as Exxon, made a cartel agreement with the Rockefeller's IG Farb and Industry to avoid destructive competition in one, in one another's markets. The Rockefeller supplied Hitler with great reserves of petroleum products without which war could not have been waged. Their IG Farb and Industry also assured Hitler of reliable supplies of glycerin for munitions from a source which is seldom mentioned in this connection the rendering of fat from concentration camp victims who died in the infamous ovens. The cartel arrangement operated completely to the benefit of Germany and completely to the detriment of the United States, as was brought out in devastating detail by the hearings held by Senator Harry S. Truman during the first half of 1942. As documented in those hearings, the Rockefeller Standard Oil treated its agreements with the Rockefeller's IG Farm and Industry as taking precedence over any considerations of patriotism or duty to America, and continued to block all efforts to make synthetic rubber and other critical war supplies available even after we were at war. Thus the Nazi war machine of Adolf Hitler was built up to provide the menace to Britain which the Rockefellers desired as a means of opening up the Saudi Arabian oil concessions permanently to themselves. The strategy would be as in World War I, to get Britain on the ropes, extract the desired concessions, and then engineer America's entry into the war to save Britain. But if there was one thing Americans did not want to do, it was to go to war again. Isolationist sentiment was strong. Therefore, an attack on America would have to be arranged. Nelson Rockefeller made sure that President Roosevelt's preparations for the war were coordinated precisely with the Rockefeller machinations overseas, including Hitler's build-up on the one hand and the plotting of the Pearl Harbor attack on the other. The Pearl Harbor attack was the crowning achievement of the Institute of Pacific Relations, or IPR, which was heavily financed by the Rockefellers and their tax-exempt foundations. Brought out later in the Congressional investigation of the IPR, John D. Rockefeller III participated in the activities of Edward C. Carter, IPR Secretary in a hideaway disguised as a barn at Lee, Massachusetts. It was there that the groundwork was laid for engineering the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The existence of the Germany-Italy-Japan axes meant that we would automatically be at war with Germany, which was menacing Britain, as soon as we were attacked by Japan. Once Churchill and the British saw after Dunkirk that they were doomed without American help, a deal was made to open up the Saudi Arabian oil concessions to the Rockefellers. The Pearl Harbor disaster was then arranged in order to galvanize Americans into support for going into war. Neither defenses were denied to the naval commanders at Pearl Harbor. The American warships at Pearl Harbor were all brought in and bottled up within the harbor like sitting ducks in spite of growing tensions with Japan and even rumors of imminent attack. Finally, when the attack itself came, advance warnings from several sources were all ignored, suppressed in Washington. The actual day and hour of the attack was known to President Roosevelt and his boss, Nelson Rockefeller, one week ahead of time, and nothing was done but to sit tight and make sure that the Pearl Harbor attack occurred as planned. 
As World War II came on, Nelson Rockefeller maneuvered Roosevelt through war preparations at home. He dictated the passage of a Universal Military Training Bill and the drafting of our youth to serve the Rockefeller cause at taxpayer expense in the forthcoming war. This done, he himself promptly evaded the draft, ordering that he be appointed Coordinator of Hemispheric Defense as far away as possible from the war front in Latin America. He also arranged to have Roosevelt demand and obtain an appropriation of $6 billion from Congress to use for his so-called coordination. With this money, he began to flood Latin America and Cuba with Communist agents to drive out proprietors and property owners, leaving the Rockefeller dynasty in virtually complete control of Latin America. Saudi Arabian oil fields were brought into production at no cost to the Rockefeller Exxon crowd, entirely at taxpayer expense and a cost of more than half a million GI's lives. Saudi Arabian oil cost the Rockefeller interests only five cents a barrel for a period of 30 years preceding the Arab oil boycott recently. Since domestic oil cost them in the range of from one to several dollars per barrel, they steadily cut down on production and purchase of oil in the United States, despite its actual abundance. This forced many independent oil companies out of business, garnered fantastic profits for themselves, which they used to rapidly take over additional major industries here and abroad and made us increasingly dependent on foreign oil. Thus they laid the basis for our present so-called energy crises, which they have also taken advantage of to raise fuel and other prices with and without government help. After the deal with Churchill was arranged by the Rockefellers to drag the United States into World War II, Nelson Rockefeller's activities at the top of the Federal Government steadily accelerated. He personally lobbied through Congress an endless array of programs which were sold as necessary for national defense and security and the like, but which were actually for the purpose of draining off our national wealth into Rockefeller coffers as rapidly as possible. Lend-Lease, for example, was used, among other things, to help build up the military and economic strength of the Soviet Union as part of the price for the Rockefellers to retain their control of the vast Baku oil fields in Russia. The concessions to these had been obtained by the Rockefellers in 1926, granted to them by Stalin as repayment for the Rockefeller role in the Russian Revolution in 1917. You probably remember from your high school history book that the Russian Revolution was financed from outside Russia. What is not usually mentioned, however, is that the Rockefeller dynasty was the source of that financing. Thus an alliance between the Russian Communists and the Rockefeller Empire was forged which has persisted down to the present day. Foreign aid beginning with the so-called Marshall Plan and continuing with the Point Four program and so forth, was the object of particular enthusiasm on the part of Nelson Rockefeller, who championed them in every possible form throughout the country. And no wonder, as early as December 1948, only months after the Marshall Plan got underway, the Chicago Tribune published an editorial based on Marshall Plan records which proved that the majority of foreign aid funds were cleverly channeled into the pockets of the Rockefellers through accounting devices of their multinational oil companies. But the various bills lobbied through their Congress by Nelson Rockefeller and his aides to require most foreign aid monies to go to certain Americans for overseas development purposes remained intact, and looting of foreign aid funds by the Rockefellers 
has never been stopped. Over the years, foreign aid has extracted mountains of money from American pockets, and it is no coincidence that the rise of American-based multinational corporations has coincided with the era of ever-expanding foreign aid. These multinationals, with their unique tax advantages, multiple citizenship, and access to foreign aid funds, among other things, were initially a product of the growing worldwide power of the Rockefeller dynasty, but have long since become a primary means by which that very power is growing by leaps and bounds. In my book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar, I have explained in detail how the huge multinationals controlled by the Rockefellers were used in 1971 and 1972 to start the United States dollar on the road toward complete destruction, a process that is now entering the final critical stages. Yes, it's Nelson Rockefeller playing the role of the inside man within our government who has been able in concert with his powerful brothers to bring the United States economy, and with it freedom, to the brink of destruction. And it is he who will offer himself as our national Savior as he pushes us off the edge. A new Constitution, so-called, has been written over a ten-year period with Rockefeller backing, and now stands ready for introduction as soon as Nelson Rockefeller is in a position to do so. The people who have written it have done so as usual under the aegis of a tax-exempt Rockefeller philanthropy with the misleading name Center for Study of Democratic Institutions. The people most central to the writing of this document, which is an elaborate prescription for dictatorship, were also associated with Rockefeller in the writing of a proposed World Constitution and setting up the United Nations. The United Nations was organized in its present form at the United Nations Organizations Conference in San Francisco in 1945, where Nelson Rockefeller represented President Roosevelt as advisor to the U.S. delegation. The completeness of Nelson Rockefeller's grip on this proceeding was expressed by Senator Vandenberg, a member of the delegation, who frankly declared to the press, quote, anything Rockefeller wants is okay, unquote. What he wanted is clear from what he did. First he arranged with the Soviets to have his most intimate and trusted associate, Alger Hiss, appointed as Secretary General of the Conference. Next, he arranged to have the World Constitution drawn up to embody his ideas presented as the UN Charter. This was gleefully accepted by the Soviets, who were particularly delighted by two of its facets. First, it in effect replaced the United States Constitution, since provisions of the UN Charter are always to be followed wherever there is any conflict. Because of this, treason against the United States of America, which is clearly defined in our Constitution, has ceased to be considered a crime or therefore punishable. This is why Nelson's brother, John D. III, for example, was immune from punishment even though his treason in connection with Pearl Harbor was established in congressional investigations. This is why Ramsey Clark, Jane Fonda, and other Americans who went to Hanoi in the midst of the Vietnam War and gave aid and comfort to the enemy were immune from punishment. Even Alger Hiss, caught in his treasonous activities on behalf of Nelson Rockefeller by Richard Nixon, could not be convicted of treason. Hiss was convicted merely of perjury in connection with treason, which is equivalent to saying that treason is okay but lying about it is the only crime. 
The second provision of the UN Charter, offered by Nelson Rockefeller and adopted by the Conference, was the establishment of a UN Military Affairs Committee to which all member nations must report in advance any contemplated military action in full detail. The Soviets, of course, were overjoyed with this because of a collateral agreement which was also made, namely, that the Chairman of the UN Military Affairs Committee must always be a Soviet general. This agreement has been carried out to the letter now for 30 years. Thus Nelson Rockefeller guaranteed that the United States would never again win an armed conflict. The outcomes of Korea and Vietnam were thus foregone conclusions as soon as they started. Tens of thousands of American GIs would be killed, hundreds of thousands would be wounded, many of them maimed for life. Billions of dollars would be siphoned out of American pockets and into those of the Rockefeller interests and allies, and the self-confidence of the American people would be undermined. The Rockefellers were so pleased with the United Nations that they donated the property for it, its permanent headquarters in New York City. During the Eisenhower regime, Nelson Rockefeller blossomed out in all his glory. Eisenhower was grateful to the Rockefellers for giving him the presidency, particularly Nelson Rockefeller's uncle, Winthrop Aldrich, who made it very attractive for a large proportion of Senator Robert Taft's delegation at the Republican Convention in 1952 to switch to Eisenhower. Ike's first act after inauguration was to give Nelson Rockefeller a free hand in reorganizing the executive branch of the government. Rockefeller moved with his entourage to his estate at 2500 Fox Hall Road in Washington, from which he ran the government while Ike went around the country building his reputation as a golfer. The only portion of the executive branch that really aroused Nelson Rockefeller's enthusiasm, however, was the military, which he promptly recycled under one roof. Having made sure through the UN and other means that America's ability to truly defend itself was at an end, he named the reorganized military complex the Defense Department. He made its prime function to sell munitions and military hardware around the world and put at the head of each division the top salesmen in his field. Their job is to sell ever more of the dynasty's war material, using field demonstrations, minor conflicts, and even wars to help sell them. It is a competitive effort among the several military branches with rewards going to the most successful. And so it is, my friends, that you have probably noticed a major shift in the way our weapon systems are developed and marketed over the past 25 years. It used to be that America developed the best possible weapons for America, and for the most part sold them off to other nations only as they were replaced by newer and better ones for our own use. But nowadays, the first consideration for a new warplane, for example, is to beat the bushes around the world to see how many other countries we can sell them to, even while the warplane itself is still on the drawing board. Needless to say, this leaves us without any real secrets in many areas of our so-called defense, but it does make a lot of money for Nelson Rockefeller and the rest of his dynasty which controls the major manufacturers of armaments in America and abroad. In the late 1950s, Nelson Rockefeller decided the time had come at last to run for elective office. His decision essentially coincided with the adoption in New York State of mechanical voting machines made by the Automatic Voting Machine Company of Jamestown, New York. This company had been purchased and merged into the Rockefeller-dominated Rockwell Manufacturing Company. Rumors were widespread that they were fixable and facilitated the stealing of elections, but these suggestions were ridiculed by some 
who proclaim themselves to be authorities. In any case, Nelson Rockefeller, New Deal Democrat, resolved to enter the race for Governor of New York State as a Republican. Since the Democrats were committed to nominating someone else, Avril Harriman. He was welcomed into the Republican Party without difficulty and easily became the nominee. After winning the election handsomely, I may say, he promptly took full control of the Automatic Voting Machine Company by buying up stock from minority stockholders at $20 per share, five times the market price of $4 a share. Of course, there was no suggestion that this reflected his evaluation of the role the machines played in his election. Several years later, in the early 1960s, a great hue and cry arose in Louisiana about the stealing of elections by means of a different machine in use there, the Shoot voting machine. Finally, the legislature was forced to act. On the basis of a concurrent resolution, the legislature staged a demonstration of the various voting machines used in the United States. Former employees of the companies demonstrated the ease with which such machines could be fixed to steal elections. In the course of the demonstration, it was shown that the shoot machine could be more easily fixed and in more ways than any other for the purpose of election stealing. Very shortly thereafter, New York State, whose Governor was now Nelson Rockefeller, ordered the disposal of their automatic voting machines at sacrifice prices and their replacement was shoot machines. Control of the shoot voting machine company was also purchased, passed through a number of obscure transfers which uh, Dunn and Bradstreet had difficulty in following, and reportedly ended up, when last checked, in an obscure subsidiary of what is now known as Exxon. The Rockefeller control of Exxon is, of course, well known. Thereafter, Nelson Rockefeller had no difficulty in being re-elected time and again, despite his growing unpopularity in New York State. While Governor, he increased uh, New York State taxes more than 500 percent. He increased the State debt more than 300 percent. He launched massive spending projects such as the Mammoth Albany Mall Project to house government offices by devious financial schemes put together by clever advisors such as John Mitchell so as to circumvent voter desires and refused to be disturbed by minor manners like three-to-one cost overruns and functional unsuitability of some of these projects. He drove numerous industries out of New York State by confiscatory taxation as he catered to soaring union and welfare demands. Indeed, the Rockefellers themselves all but shut down their Exxon offices in New York about four years ago, transferring 3,000 employees to Houston, Texas, and 1,000 of them to Hong Kong. Altogether, Nelson Rockefeller succeeded during his years as Governor in vastly increasing the number of unemployed and those on welfare rolls. Now having honed his abilities in every possible form, Nelson Rockefeller is at last nearing success in the goal he has sought for decades, to become the openly acknowledged ruler of the United States and to use our country as the springboard for a final conquest of the entire world for the Rockefeller dynasty. He created the 25th Amendment by which he and Gerald Ford have come to office without submitting themselves to a vote of the people. He had his agent, Senator Birch Bayh, propose this scheme only three weeks after the assassination of President John F. Kennedy and had Senator Bayh push it successfully through the Congress. He then had Herbert Brownell move the 25th Amendment through the States to ratification in unusually short time, in two months' time, by the way, by 1967. The stage was then set for the downfall of President Nixon when the time was ripe several years later. The Watergate scandal was masterminded by Nelson Rockefeller 
and carried out by his private detective agency, the CIA, including the breaking of the story in the Washington Post by CIA agents posing as reporters. My friends, the things I have just told you about are shocking, brutal, and frankly unbelievable at first hearing, but I warn you, please do not dismiss them out of hand simply because of their awesome nature. These things are the truth and they merely give you an idea of what is coming soon if Nelson Rockefeller, working in concert with his brothers David, Lawrence, and John D. III, is allowed to succeed in his dictatorial plans. The first step in stopping this madness is for you, the American citizen, to realize what is happening. Hitler achieved his post by legal means as set up in the Constitution of the Weimar Republic. He was appointed Chancellor of the Reich by aging President von Hindenburg January 30, 1933. And remember, President Ford on August 20, 1974, appointed Nelson Rockefeller as his Vice President. The German citizens who watched Adolf Hitler maneuver his way to power in many cases simply could not believe their eyes and preferred to hope out of blind optimism that things would not deteriorate completely. They suffered horribly for failing to observe, to grasp the truth, and to act. Please, my friends, let us not allow this to happen in America. Until next month, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.